I'll give him the flood responsibility <laughs> because someone said, you know about climate change, don't you? That is to do with flooding, so you do that. Um, thanks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so that's, that's me. It's a quite a large team. Um, it's actually real luck. We've got the ecologists, the landscape professionals. I'm going to say the archaeologists because, believe it or not, some of this sub stuff actually happens under the ground and they're going to be quite important people if you've got the wrong set of conditions. It's amazing what you can find out about drainage from historic maps. If none of you have gone to your archaeology team and started to look at those 18, 1700 maps, believe me, it's worth it. Um, got the landscape professionals, got sustainable design, so it's all in the right place. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Um, Apologies for this, but I thought I'd have an inspiring moment at the, uh, at the beginning. And thanks to Bob and, um, uh, uh, and to Anthony, um, because they've done a lot of work with us. So I've used all their photos. Okay, because when I went out and thought, I want to show some stuff in Hertfordshire, do you know what? I can't find it. Um, although, to be fair, the bottom middle one, I'm assured by Bob, is in Hertfordshire. Um, I'm not sure where, but it's there somewhere. Um, the reason I can't find it is actually most... Hertfordshire's had a long history of... Um, Sub systems. Um, the land doesn't drain properly, or we can get infiltration. Most of it's overlying either sand and gravel or chalk. So, what we have is loads of soakaways. An awful lot of our towns that were built 1950s, 1960s are sitting on soakaways, um, some quite large ones. Um, those that are about 30 years old don't work anymore, as I found out from February 2014. Most of the instances that I've gone to in terms of flooding is where there are large soakaways under estates and people have suddenly found they don't work anymore, therefore their properties flood. So we're dealing with the effects of effectively a lack of maintenance, a lack of understanding um, about what's involved with these facilities. And I kind of have a look, your point about management companies, I, I just think, oh, oh well, I'll be retired by then, hopefully. <laughs> um, but the problems we're facing today of who owns what, where does that asset go? Um, What's that pipe suddenly I found in the corner of a field that looks cracked? Um, is there a soak away under there? Believe me, do we want people in 30 years' time to be sitting with exactly the same issues? But the problem is we've got a lot more property service. But anyway, sorry, enough of the politics. So I'm going to go through where we're going in Hertfordshire, some of the issues I see of working with the planning system. Um, I've put avoid in the one-size-fits-all solution because I've seen a few come through because they've asked for my advice for some reason. And... Um, there's a lot of similarity in what you get from, I'm going to say developers, but I mean developers consultants. Okay? The developer is as good as the consultant that's advising them. And I'm not having a go at consultants, but actually, for those of you that have been perusing the job market, because if you know about this, I think there's some opportunities coming up. There is an awful lot of jobs being created that's there, I think, to service a growing demand amongst developers for people to design this stuff. I don't think there's the capacity or the knowledgeable capacity to deliver that. So we're going to be dealing, quite frankly, with a mixture of some really good stuff, some stuff that will probably work, and some stuff where you've got people that have never done it before and suddenly gone, oh, I know about that. I've read a book. I can do that. Um, some examples of how I think we can maximise some of the multiple benefits. What we've been doing about trying to empower planners um, and building capacity in Hertfordshire. A um, bit of context, million plus people, half a million homes, 11 planning authorities. Um, I would say all political parties represented in, across the districts, but that's not true because UKIP haven't got anywhere yet. Um, but we've got conservative controlled authorities, we've got labor controlled authorities, we've got Lib Dem, um, all with different agendas. And believe me, one of the things that's not been mentioned here today, and I'm gonna flag it up because I'm gonna try and pick up all the through is, don't forget that planning is about politics. Uh, fundamentally, we're dealing with technical solutions, but it will be about politics. Um, some of the uncertainties, which I felt I had to put them in because they're the things that keep me awake at night. So, um, half your approach. Um, because we've been seeing some of the problems, if you like, of 30 years of lack of maintenance, lack of understanding, and people forgetting about things, the whole approach is um, really sort of trying to mimic natural drainage systems. And you've heard this stuff before, but it's kind of worth reiterating. You know, increasing natural losses, slowing flow, using landscape. Got 2,000 kilometres of ordinary watercourse in Hertfordshire, um, a lot of main rivers. Um, we've got the capacity to discharge to watercourses, providing we can get access across their pipe land, all those kind of issues. Not my problem, be a planning problem now. And the key thing, if we're looking, thinking about maintenance, from my point of view, is I want this stuff to be visible. Because if the community doesn't understand how it works, then it won't work. 
And that's not about now, that's about five years time when people have started moving around and someone's gone, well, if I fill that in at the back of my garden, gives me a space to put my um, patio or to put the barbecue there, that's not gonna be a problem, is it? Until the next rainfall event when they realized it was a watercourse. And actually what they've done is they've flooded their neighbor. So we don't want it out of sight. We don't want it underground. Um, and we don't want it somebody else's problem. And unfortunately, it's a good job DCLG aren't here, isn't it, really? Um, ultimately, I think we are going to have it out of sight. I think we are going to have it underground. And I think somebody's going to be trying to find someone to blame about it. However, we are practical people and we will get through that. So, you've, it seems like we colluded, didn't it, in terms of the three speakers, in terms of actually we've all got a similar design, which basically says, look, the SUDS design process needs to go on right the way through the planning process. The issue for me is, where does it fit in pre-app? And who's going to pay us to advise them? Because the resources aren't going to be there. It says somebody's going to pay me to come to a pre-app meeting. I'm not going to do it. Um, and it needs the planners to be telling the developer, you need to get these people involved. Um, the, ag the environment agency are now charging for pre-app. We will as well. There's a question mark, I think, about the degree to which the actual system will bear the costs of getting the right advice. So master planning at pre-app. I've put conceptual size design between pre-app and outline application. Um, my view, um, I don't think you can put an outline application in until you've got a good idea of how you're going to do that SUDS planning process and where you're going to fit the things on site. Too often we see the design process going about how do I fit the maximum number of properties on this site or how do I maximise my opportunities for floor space? Oh, I've got to fit some drainage in. Where does that go? I can put it underground because it can go under the car park. Um, what we've got to do is get those ideas in at the beginning and actually encourage creative design. An outline size design, it's fairly obvious, detailed drainage design. And by detailed, I mean detailed drainage design with all of the things in there that we expect to see, not the detailed drainage designs that planners have been seeing to date. So working with the planning system, I kind of think, how do you do this? I thought, okay, let's go. Just in the last month, okay, when I forwarded out to all my heads of planning and said, Eric Pickles has made this wonderful announcement on the 18th of December. Here's your Christmas present. Um, did you know? Suggest you make a contribution to the consultation. Some of the issues I got back. So, I don't know, might have a vote. We do that already. Who thinks they do that already? Okay. Is it a matter for building control? Okay. Um, we just do that when we get to the landscape strategy bit. Shame Sue's gone because I'm sure she'd disagree with that bit. <laughs> the priority is to get affordable housing, so we're not really going to push for that. Okay. This is the one I like best. The EA have not said anything, so it must be okay. Okay. Um, I've actually had physically development management um, off officers say to me, EA didn't respond, so it must be fine. Not the EA didn't respond, it's our job to make sure it's fine. Okay. Uh, the other one, which I quite like, the site is not in the floodplain. Um, I have had to explain to a few people that surface water doesn't live in floodplains. <laughs> um, and I have 11 strategic flood risk assessments, all of which have no mention of surface water in them. So relying on SFRAs and FRAs to pick this up in the short term won't work. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, it's a lovely county. That discussion was all with heads of planning or heads of development management. Okay, so what I'm saying here is actually don't believe the planners have got the capacity or the understanding to pick this up. And, and they're not bad planners, all right? It's just they've relied on the EA for so long, they're so used to them telling them if it's okay or not, that it's a decision that's been made by the EA where appropriate. So are we going to end up with one size fits all? Um, for me, there is an issue here, I think, both with the planning process, the lead local flood authority, the EA and whatever it does, and whoever else you can get engaged. And I would advise you get highways engaged early. Um, highways engineers are lovely people, um, and they like roads. What they don't like is green bits. Okay, um, so green is not highway. There's, there's, there's an educative process around some of this. Engage early. We've got to get creative solutions. I would argue that we've got a palette of tools available to us 
we need to add to that palette. It's not enough in, in all circumstances. We need to get people thinking from a design perspective how they can create the right solutions in a creative way. Fitting suds, water into our development so that people understand it and they live with it. We need to maximize the use of green space for suds. Anybody who thinks you're gonna lower development yields on sites to deliver suds, forget it. Money talks. So where's the space that we're already using for something else that we can maximize for dealing with water? There are some massive opportunities about habitat creation. One word of caution. The great crested newt is a protected species. Um, there's hundreds of the buggers in Hertfordshire. They're everywhere. Um, and uh, I, I, I do the ecology bit. We do take you seriously. But what it means is if you're doing habitat creation, you've got to think about those, those issues. If you're likely to get it populated by protected species, you have to have the appropriate arrangements in place. Think about it early up. Don't think, oh, whatever, we'll deal with that. Because if a developer thinks, doesn't think about it, the management company that ends up with it won't think about it. You don't want people being prosecuted because they've stepped on a newt. Um, always aim for on-surface management and treatment. Um, again, we didn't talk. Like the subcatchments make sense. Um, everything I've seen says if you divide it into subcatchments, management becomes easier. We are looking for ease of maintenance. Ideally, the community can do it themselves. If you've got expensive maintenance arrangements, I've got a development proposal in half, it shall remain unnamed because it's unfair. Okay, where um, loads of space, greenfield space, still put a tank in. Um, what was it? Something like about 8,000 cubic meters tank to code, code for the development. Was offering us a one and a half million pound section 106 settlement to manage the suds for 30 years. 1.1 million of that was for the replacement of the tank. So actually what they were offering was 200,000 for the management of the rest of the suds. The rest of the money we didn't put aside. Tanks are expensive to install and they're expensive to replace and people do not realize that. They're an easy solution, avoid them, mostly. And make sure when, from our, my point of view in working with planners, what I wanna make sure is that the people that are occupying developments, whether that be business premises, whether it be residential premises, they understand the drainage system. If they don't understand the drainage system, it won't work. It's not for a management company to understand. The management company is not there every day. It's not for the planner to understand, because they're not, once it's developed, then they're not interested. It's for the occupier to understand. Getting that delivery from the developer through to the occupier is gonna be absolutely critical. So where do we maximize the multiple benefits? Well, again, this, this list is kind of obvious. Landscape and green space, okay? We can manage water. Um, the other misconception, suds on green space is wet. No, it's not. It's wet when it needs to be. It's an interesting debate if you ever get into school development. Suds in schools. Don't want open water, neither do we. Um, if there's open water there, it means it's, man it's, ma it's, ma it's managing water. Do we want something where kids can drown? No. Um, believe me, we're not into that game. Um, but, <laughs> but that's the arguments you will get. Um, it's the arguments I get from my own authority. When you're looking at suds in schools, they don't want it. Um, and if you can't do it there, you can't do it anywhere. Okay? Water quality issues. Um, I think there's going to be a big issue with water quality. Discussions we've had with the Environment Agency have indicated it's the one area where they're going to reserve the right to comment on every application. And unless we're very careful and we tie that up, we're going to get conflicting advice between the EA and the Subs Authority. That mustn't happen. We've got to tie it together. Looking at the amenity benefits and obviously delivering public open space. It gives us those opportunities and there's some big, 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 big opportunities there. You've already talked about the opportunities about actually interesting urban design. A lot of the spaces that have been built today, they're kind of pretty bland. This gives us an opportunity to do different things. So where are we going? Empowerment and capacity building. Um, in Hertfordshire, um, we had a premonition that government was gonna go this way. Um, forward thinking authority like us, we knew that they wouldn't implement schedule three. So what we did is actually, we thought we need to engage with the planners. We didn't do that because of that. What we did is said, this will not work even as a SAB unless the planning institutions, the planning bodies are properly engaged with this process because we can't deliver half of what we need to if the planners are fighting us. The planners and us have to be engaged, have to be talking to each other. Delivered half, 11 half day sessions, one in each LPA. And I would urge government, if they are thinking about capacity building, if you think you're gonna get development control officers away from their desks when they've got a planning caseload that's like that with an eight week deadline, forget it. 
you need to be going to them. We had to literally go into each LPA to deliver those sessions because we couldn't get them to come out. Don't forget, there's a whole bunch of professions in here. If you don't deliver to all of them, and from my point of view, planners, building control, highways, green space managers, landscape officers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any one of those can derail the process, okay? You can have the best scheme in the world. If the developer says, I can't get it adopted because the green space manager said it doesn't meet my mowing profile, and no one will adopt it, then your developers are gonna be trying to push. If highways are sitting there and saying, we don't want any roof water into our highways drainage system, I've got one of those, and you end up having to say, well, no, we need two separate systems, you're not gonna get suds. It won't be affordable. So there is a real capacity building, not just with the planning system or with the local flood authorities, but with those other professionals who play a role in development. So I've mentioned politicians. Um, what I found intriguing, both with DEFRA and DCLG, is nobody's talked to politicians about this, other than the minister, sorry, ministers. Um, and in DEFRA's case, that's been several. <laughs> sorry, Laura. <laughs> um, but local politicians, believe me, drainage on development sites for local politicians can be a major issue. And if you don't persuade them that such is the appropriate approach or they're not on board, um, don't forget the people that give planning permission are not the officers. It's the politicians. And if they're not bought into this, if you've not engaged with them, if you've not built that capacity, that's where it's gonna, it can go wrong. Um, I mentioned others. Um, as a county council, we have the joy of 77 members. I think universally, every single one of those, maybe with the exception of one or two, is also a district councillor somewhere. And indeed, probably about 60% of them are also parish councillors. It must be mad. But fundamentally, as politicians, they're going to be engaged in that development at several different stages, in several different places, in different capacities. And you've still got the problem of um, the ones that say we're after growth and... I'm sitting there as a lead local flood authority, and what do I do when my leader comes to me and says, that development, I know is a bit of a drainage problem over there, but we really want it to work. Um, is there any way we can make sure we don't object, but that we put a positive approach to it and we get it to do the right thing? I'm not saying that will happen, but I'm sure some of you out there will go, oh, could happen. The right development, the right place. Um, problem's not gonna occur for a few years. We can get that away. We can meet our housing targets. I've got at least three planning authorities without a five-year housing land supply, and we all know how that works. It means we're having planning by appeal. Um, how are we gonna do that? Um, I should have put in here um, planning inspectors, but I'm assuming that DCLG are gonna do that bit. Um, lead local flood authority resources. Um, has any lead local flood authority in here got all the resources they need to do this? Do you think you're gonna have all the resources you need to do this in eight weeks time? Uh, there's a line at the bottom there I thought I'd put in, which is, um, we've got a couple of enlightened consultants. Developers. Um, I think I've been involved in this now for a number of years, Paul. Um, it's been an interesting process. I've enjoyed every minute of it, your trip to London. <laughs> um, I think we've had the same discussion probably on four different rounds in different locations and whatever. Um, and there have been developers involved in that process. And some of those have been really good. Some have been how you'd expect. Some haven't understood, some have actually given us some really good guidance. They're not the problem. When you go back to your authorities, those local developers that are building the odd 15 home site, do they know about this? Are they engaged? Do they have the right advice? Are they gonna be able to deliver what you want them to deliver? Are they enlightened about green space management within their development? No. Who's gonna have the capacity to build the intelligence and the information base amongst the development industry not just the big boys, but everybody to enable this to get delivered, not as one-offs that we all try hard for and what's happened, but on a consistent basis to deliver the right solutions. At the moment, I think everybody's looking at the lead local flood authorities to do that. Because I'm fairly certain a lot of planning authorities won't be able to, not across the board. And for me, I think there's a big challenge around how we do that. The other thing there is, are we just gonna have a couple of really big arguments in the first two years to make our point? Um, and what happens if we lose? What happens when it goes to appeal? We're we gonna be prepared to stand there and say to a planning inspector, no, this is the wrong approach. And are we gonna win? Because until we get that body of 
evidence that body of case law we don't know and believe me that's resource hungry the question is are we gonna have the resource to do that I ended up when I thought about it with a bunch of questions um, and I'm I'm sitting I'm sure all of you are sitting today I'm sure many of you got the same questions and I don't think I've got any answers on any of them so um, as I already said I'm not an expert in anything um, I'm just a manager that's sat there thinking oh god um, what will the MPPF guidance say we've said it will reflect the national standards okay that's great but what weight is it going to give to them? How we, how is that going to be taken account of? How is that going to actually reflect uh, in a DC officer who's basically told, I need to get that site away? Um, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? What's the weight that's going to be given to the drainage concerns? If we've got real concerns, at, at the moment, if the EA say they object, I mean, most planning authorities, I'm not saying all, most, would actually be very reluctant to give you know, outright permission to say, yeah, no problem. Are they going to afford that same weight to comments from the lead local flood authorities? I think that's going to be an interesting test. Um, I think that final one, the expert advice that's going to be necessary. Um, we've always said we haven't got enough resources. What happens when you get the really d difficult site that perhaps really needs that expert to have a look at it, to redo the developer's calcs on the volumes of water that you've got to deal with? That's going to cost money. Who's paying for that? Are we going to do it as lead local flood authorities? Are the, are the planning authorities going to fund it? I'm not sure. Um, locally, what impact will the political process have? Um, viability. <laughs> um, uh, if anybody's been through a development viability process in order to work out Section 106 contributions, it's good fun, isn't it? Um, even I don't understand how they get to some of those numbers. Um, how do we deal with the cumulative impact of small developments? We're talking about majors, um, and in Hertfordshire, I'm sitting thinking, well, majors probably deal with that. It's about 350, 450 applications a year. There's a few other clauses in that consultation document. Developments that have a surface water flood risk, what does that mean? Um, developments with phrased groundwater issues. I'm not sure what that means, or proximity to an ordinary water course. I'm looking and saying, from a dealing with consultations anywhere between 400 and 4,000 I think um, our planning authority is going to be highly risk averse and go we're not sure we're going to send it to you in which case it's not necessarily the detail bit that's the key it's actually the administrative task of sorting through the rubbish to the stuff you really need to get to deal with and I think that's, uh, that's going to be a big issue the uh, final one is self-explanatory, isn't it, really? I, I think the really good news from a lead local flood authority point of view is I'm sitting here saying, actually, adoption and maintenance, that's the local planning authority's problem now. Um, and uh, I really want to stay out of it. Thank you.